In Poor Things, Willem Dafoe plays a Victorian-era experimental surgeon named Godwin Baxter. In one of the earliest scenes, he's giving a mortician lecture with a cadaver. During the lecture, he makes a comment about the difference between man and animal. Quote, if there is a difference. Honestly, that's a pretty good distillation of director Yorgos Lanthimos' whole thing. In Dogtooth, the children are the metaphorical dogs. In The Lobster, the characters are literally turned into an animal of their choosing if they fail to find a mate. In The Killing of a Sacred Deer, Colin Farrell's wife and kids are metaphorically the titular deer, one of whom must be sacrificed. In The Favorite, Queen Anne keeps rabbits as stand-ins for her children that were either stillborn or died shortly after birth. Lansimos' movies are about how people are beasts, metaphorically or otherwise, and the ways we attempt to separate ourselves from beasts, the silly little norms and customs and rules of society that we create for ourselves, those things often don't hold up under the slightest bit of scrutiny. Poor Things opens with a woman jumping off Tower Bridge in London to her death. Kind of, sort of, to her death. Defoe's Godwin character spends his spare time conducting bizarre experiments on animals, like putting a duck's head on a dog's body, and putting a bulldog head on a chicken body, and stuff like that. And also conducting some Frankensteinian experiments on humans, including reanimating the woman from Tower Bridge, who now goes by the name Bella Baxter and is played by Emma Stone. Speaking of Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's father was named William Godwin, so Defoe's character being named Godwin Baxter is probably a winky nod to Frankenstein's origin. Plus it means that Bella constantly refers to him as God, which is both amusingly on the nose considering he created her, but it's also just his name, so... Though the reanimated Bella appears to have the brain of a toddler, she's developing quickly, and Godwin enlists one of his mortician students, Max, played by Rami Youssef, to observe the progress of her development. Once she becomes verbal and refines her motor skills a bit, God wants Max to marry Bella on the condition that they continue to live at God's house and never leave. But when God tries to draw up a legal contract saying as much, the curious and intrepid Bella instead opts to run away with the lawyer, a Lothario wonderfully named Duncan Wedderburn, played with relish by Mark Ruffalo. Wedderburn whisks Bella off to Lisbon, where she discovers, among other things, the pleasures of the flesh, or furious jumping as she calls it. Then they're on a luxury cruise ship, they make a pit stop in Alexandria, they wind up penniless in Paris, and finally Bella finds herself back in London by the end of the movie. All along, Bella is constantly progressing with her language, cognition, awareness of herself and the world around her, social cues, critical thinking, empathy, and a sense of justice. I found an awful lot to love here. Holly Waddington's costume work for starters, particularly with Bella. She's initially in fluffier, looser-fitting blouses, often with a mismatched, sparer bottom half, kind of like she's a toddler dressing herself. As Bella's sense of herself matures, her costumes get sharper, more form-fitting, what Emma Stone calls more militant, as she becomes more sure of herself and has more purpose. The production design is remarkable too, period appropriate to an extent, but also with surreal modern flourishes that fit the Lanthimos aesthetic. It has a very dollhouse feel, maybe because they actually built all these locations as elaborate composite sets. Godwin's house in the lab, the ship, the city streets of London, Lisbon, and Paris all constructed on a soundstage in Budapest. Robbie Ryan's cinematography is great. Oscar nominated for the second time on a Lanthimos movie. Jerskin Fendrix's score is great in his feature film scoring debut. Tony McNamara's script is really funny. I really liked his work on The Favorite as well, but this is even better. So like I said, an awful lot to love here, but it's hard for the headline to not be about Emma Stone's performance, both in its specificity, but also in its breadth. From a babbling toddler who's only half potty trained to a thoughtful, bilingual, cunning socialist. It's bravura. I deeply admire Lily Gladstone's work in Killers of the Flower Moon and Sandra Huller's work in Anatomy of a Fall, and I'd be thrilled if either of them won Best Actress, but I don't know, man, no one's doing it like Emma Stone. This is career best work in a career that's already seen three other Oscar nominations and a Best Actress statue. Elsewhere, I always love to see Willem Dafoe in anything, particularly in bizarre period pieces. He's just got a face that fits well in a world like this, even after four hours in the makeup chair. I kind of feel the opposite about Rami Youssef. Before seeing this, I had a hard time picturing him in a Victorian era period piece. Maybe because I'm just too used to seeing him in a Mets hat, but I was wrong. He's really great in this. Speaking of millennial comedians, Gerard Carmichael is here, who I really admire as a comedian and as a performer, but 
He might be in a bit of a different movie than everyone else. Then in the last bit of the movie, we get surprise Chris Abbott, and he is not in a different movie than everyone else. I legit thought the movie was about to end, and then Chris Abbott just walks in and starts throwing fastballs for the last 10 or 15 minutes. I was kind of hoping for a supporting actor nomination for Defoe, but I'm not really upset that it went to his co-star Mark Ruffalo, playing an absolute cad. A ridiculous little man with wildly misplaced confidence and no self-awareness. After one of their first marathon lovemaking sessions, he cautions Bella not to fall in love with him because he's only good for some short-lived fun, and then within like 40 minutes he's proposing marriage to her. And once he's jilted, he does a fun streetcar named Desire homage. Bella. The first part of the movie is in black and white, but it eventually transitions to vibrant color. The break into color is when Bella has sex for the first time, so they're kind of doing the Pleasantville thing, I guess. It's kind of funny, and a bit to the movie's point, how much the sex scenes dominated the early conversation around the movie. After it premiered at Venice, the two things I heard about the movie is that Emma Stone is sensational, and there were a lot of sex scenes. Bizarre Lanthimosy sex scenes. And yeah, I guess relative to our current moment of pretty sexless media for the last decade or so, there's quite a bit, but it felt to me that there was disproportionate conversation around them. And to the movie's point, Bella doesn't think sex is a big deal, despite Mark Ruffalo's horror and condemnation at her sleeping with men who aren't him. Again, the movie tracks Bella's growth from an effective toddler to a full-grown adult, and that development includes a sexual awakening, but that's just one component. As Justin Chang points out, Bella's sexual liberation is tied to a moral awakening. This is a non-exhaustive list of Bella's discoveries. In London, language and masturbation. Then in Lisbon, intercourse, desserts, dancing, and what she sees as boring limitations of polite society. Then on the ship, Emerson and philosophy. And then in Alexandria, poverty, suffering, and inequality. And then in Paris, the world's oldest profession, sexual jealousy in men, and socialism. And we must go to the meeting of socialists. Your horse! We are our own means of production. Go away. Finally, back in London, Bella discovers the contradiction of human existence and consciousness, something none of us asked for but are given anyway. Emma Stone has said that this is a movie about a woman without shame. Yorgos Lanthimos said it's about a woman who has a second chance, someone who hasn't been molded in a very specific manner to perceive the world in a certain way. I also kind of see it as a movie about a woman's sexuality and the men who try to control it. And when I say the movie is about that, I mean like structurally speaking. In the first act, she discovers self-pleasure and is told not to do it by her male caretaker. The break into two is when she discovers how much she likes furious jumping. And Duncan initially seems to like her mostly because of her sexuality, but he quickly becomes a jealous keeper of it. Once Bella really begins to discover her sexuality beyond just him, he then feels threatened by it. At one point, they are on a snowy Paris sidewalk with no money and nowhere to go, and he yells at her, a whore is the worst thing a woman can be. And the frustration and futility when he says this is almost comical, because Bella barely reacts to it. She just eats her pastry and calmly hears him out, and then it's just like, hey, we had no money before and now we have pastry, so what's the problem? Then after really taking command of her sexuality in the second half of Act 2, the third act is when she decides to settle down and marry a man who respects her and her ownership of her own body, but then Chris Abbott steps in as like the final boss of men controlling Bella's sexuality in very literal and insidious ways. More generally, the movie is about a woman moving through a revolving door of men looking to control her in various ways for various reasons. As she encounters social norms, she pushes back on them, and in some instances reveals how arbitrary those rules are. Far from the first person to make this observation, but it weirdly is a very fitting, if age inappropriate, double feature with Barbie. And as I say in that video, that's a movie I like quite a bit, but between the two Best Picture nominees about a woman discovering gender dynamics and initially taking to men but then evolving past the need for men, Poor Things kind of eats Barbie's lunch. Mm -hmm.